Well, hello there, person! Ready to check out what's new making the video game Wraithbinder? This is, uh, this is something fun here. I was watching my friend play Wraithbinder the other day. Just somebody, uh, a good friend that was, that had never played Wraithbinder before. And, uh, watched them play through a whole match and get to the end of it. And it was really neat because he accidentally kept hitting the, um, the times, my, I have some debug commands which speed up and slow down time. He was accidentally hitting those keys, and he made it so time was going really fast at the end, and I thought, that looks really fun. So I added in something pretty interesting here where the match actually starts to speed up time as we get to, um, as the world erodes and it crumbles inward and it comes down here to the very end, time is speeding up. I've got it uh, set to a, a factor which I can change with data. Um, so right now it's set to about 1.33, right? So time speeds up by about 30% here at the end. And it really makes the action here at the end a lot more frenetic and interesting. And um, it's a super fun thing. So um, that's kind of what's, that's a really fun thing that's been added recently. And I uh, worked on a lot of things related to this sort of end game scene where uh, making sure the MVP is the correct player and this countdown happens correctly. And uh, the stats are, are been refined too on this ending menu. So we're going to see that here in a second once this timer goes all the way down. Um, we'll see the stats menu. And uh, there's a lot of new things on there. It's been refined a bit. So things are looking really good there. So let's wait for this to count down and boom got a victory condition and so it looks like most of the people got on ah, there's a little bit of a bug here um, in that uh, it looks like everybody's on the pink team uh, which is it looks like it might have been ace but it's not showing the correct wraith count so yeah ace has two wraiths that's got to be wrong yeah anyways the wraith count is all off right now um, Mostly because a player can change teams when they become a wraith, and also they can change teams um, when they uh, when they get they kill someone as a wraith, or when they're a wraith that kills another wraith. It, it, it gets really confusing. So, anyways, I got some work to do there to fix this wraith count. That'll make a big difference. Um, but anyways, anyways, look at these new stats. This is pretty cool. So we've got um, a wraith count. It shows who is the MVP there. It shows everybody's level, experience, kills, deaths, assists, the number of bases that they held, too. This is kind of interesting. So if you go and you steal someone's base, it shows you that you now have two bases and the other person has zero bases. Um, uh, the matter that you used, the damage that you dealt, the healing that you did or, or got healed by, and uh, the number of blocks you had. So when you use your shield to block someone, that's how many blocks you get. Uh, hits are however many hits you get with your sword, so you, or uh, yeah, any of your weapons basically, you, you use your weapon, if it's a hit, it counts as a hit, if it's a miss, it counts as a miss, so you got hits, misses, the accuracy, which is just a ratio of hits to misses, and then the distance that you travel too, so it's kind of interesting, you can see who's camping, you can see how much players moved around during the match, you can see who is accurate, you can see how much damage you did, so this is kind of interesting to have all these stats here set up. Um, so, but that's not all. Let's check out what else is new. Uh, there is a lot of foundational work done here in the code. Let's peek at the code a bit. Uh, this is foundational work to get procedurally generated maps. And um, basically what's, what's new here is that there's a block grid. So, um, previously, the way this worked was that there was a, an, a, a creation, an entity creation function which would loop over um, the entire grid of the whole, well, yeah, there was no grid at that point, but there were, it would loop over all the positions on the map and choose what entity to put at each point, and it would create that entity right, right there and right then. Uh, what it does now, this is a little bit uh, more refined, um, it's basically creating a grid. So it sets up, uh, there's a bunch of block types. Let's look at some of those. So there's like a block, there's a, base, there's your blade, there's a guardian, there's a statue, a mender, a marker, pillars, walls, spawners, all these kinds of different uh, blocks that you can create. And uh, there's also another grid for different ground types. There's the ground block, there's the ground sky, the ground water, and then there's stairs. Uh, so it goes and it creates a, a uh, fills in a grid full of these block types. And then it uses a create block, func block type function 
to go and create all those blocks. So um, it first it creates the grid and fills it all in, and then it goes and creates everything in a separate step. And what that allows everything to do is to be a little bit more layered in its approach to creating procedurally generated maps. So I use this technique with Songbringer, and uh, basically it it allows you to do things like this, like. Before, when you're creating entities with while you're you're looping over the grid, you wouldn't be able to do higher level things like going back after you've already created all things in your in your grid, and then adding in uh, maybe like a like for example, let's say you wanted to add a row of trees around an island that you created. Uh, you could do that in the in one step the way that it was before, but it's a lot easier to have layers of of function functionality where you can go and after you've already created your base block types you can go and fill things in around the grid that way um, and it also makes things a lot better when you're using maze generation and other types of procedurally generated techniques to um, to have these separated out into two different distinct steps so um, this is the function that basically goes and chooses what block creation function it's going to use and then calls that function and then so every one of these different block types has its own function where um, it goes and chooses it, it does a little bit of math chooses what entity it's going to create and then it goes ahead and creates the entity and then after it's created the entity maybe it sets it up a little bit further like this is creating a, a grass and it's rotating the grass right here after it's created it and it's setting which ID it is for, so the players can hide inside it um, so, yeah, that's a re this is a really big step towards having procedurally generated maps, and also for uh, different tile types, different um, art styles, right? So there's going to be more art styles than there is right now. Right now, there's really only just one art style, but I want to have lots of them, lots of different planets you can move, go to, maybe some caves, some spaceships you can fight on, stuff like that. So this is really going to help there as well. Uh, and there's one more thing I want to show you. Uh, that's been created here, and this is the the ability to remap your controls from the settings menu. What's going on here? I thought I ran it. Uh, 